So, good morning and uh, today we will uh, start a new topic. This will be on natural convective heat transfer. Um, whatever we did so far, you know, the external force convection and internal force convection. So, most of you already have done the hydrodynamics part of it before. In fluid mechanics, you start with the uh, Blasius boundary layer theory for the external force convection or the, the fully developed internal flows for a channel and for a duct and so on. But in this particular topic, natural convective heat transfer, definitely you would not have done this in a separate fluid mechanics course because this is one problem where uh, hydrodynamics and heat transfer are coupled together. So, unlike the other external flows and internal force convection, so you cannot separate the hydrodynamics from the heat transfer part in the case of natural convection because it is basically the energy equation which drives the momentum in this case. So, today from today the next uh, the focus for the next 5 or 6 hours will be on natural convective heat transfer. So, what is the fundamental physics behind the natural convective heat transfer or the, the motion, the driving force behind natural convection? We will look at the example of a simple flat plate which is aligned vertical. Okay. So, in the case of uh, external force convection, it does not matter whether you have a flat plate placed vertically or horizontally. Since you push the air by external means, you create a boundary layer and we do not take into account the effect of gravity in those cases. But when we study natural convection, the effect of gravity becomes important. In fact, the buoyancy is the driving force here. So, it matters what is the orientation of the particular configuration. So, let us look at a flat plate which is oriented vertically and we have gravity acting downwards. So, initially the ambient air is quiescent that means there is no um, forced convection of anything. So, you just place the flat plate in a quiescent atmosphere and then you heat this plate, you can either maintain a constant wall temperature or a constant heat flux boundary condition and you can heat this vertical plate. Now, naturally what happens is that the fluid layer which is in contact with this plate will be at a higher temperature compared to the ambient since you are heating the plate. So, let us assume the temperature of the ambient to be T infinity. So, therefore, the fluid layer will be at some temperature T which will be greater than T infinity. So, now therefore, you know that the density is a function of temperature especially very strongly for gases. So, when you look at say quiescent atmosphere, now the heated air here will therefore, have a density which is different from the density somewhere outside where you have T infinity. So, the density here rho of T therefore, will be less than rho at T infinity. So, that means you have a lower density air close to the hot surface. Now, the tendency of the lower density air is to naturally rise up. right? So, therefore, you will have over a period of time, you will see a visually a boundary layer which is actually forming and growing from the leading edge. The leading edge here is actually the bottom of the plate here all the way up. Okay. So, we will have a coordinate system x and y in such a way that x is in the direction of the along the plate and y is perpendicular to the plate. So, our origin will be starting from the bottom this is your x and the perpendicular coordinate is your y. Okay. So, in the case of therefore, the natural convective boundary layer, the boundary layer formation happens essentially due to a temperature difference. So, this is the starting point of the convection to happen and because of this temperature difference, this uh, 
essentially um, maintains a density difference between the hot air close to the plate and the ambient quiescent air outside. So, this density difference will cause the lighter air which is in contact with the plate to rise up and therefore, a boundary layer is formed. Okay. So, now you can very clearly see that the cause for the uh, boundary layer is essentially due to the temperature difference. So, the temperature difference is the, the driving potential in the case of natural convection unlike the pressure gradient in the case of internal force convection or the external flow of air or water in the case of um, the external boundary layers. So, in this case you have temperature difference as the driving potential. So, this is a very important aspect of natural convection and therefore, uh, intuitively you should understand that the momentum and the energy equations have to be coupled in some way. So, un unless the energy the, the information from the energy equation goes into the momentum you cannot actually solve for the boundary layer growth. Uh, now, you can also do the same same way by reversing the temperature direction that means, you can have a cold plate and you can have heated air. Okay. Suppose, you have a plate where your T wall is less than T infinity. Okay. So, your T infinity is somewhere here and T wall is less than T infinity. So, what will be the direction of the boundary layer growth in this case? from top to bottom because here this density will be a function of temperature which will be lower. So, this temperature is lower than T infinity therefore, this density will be greater than rho at T infinity. So, essentially the heavier fluid has a tendency to go down and therefore, you have a boundary layer in this case which essentially goes from top to bottom. Okay. So, now if you want to represent how the velocity and the temperature profile varies at a particular location x location for this case. So, unlike the case of uh, external uh, boundary layer where outside you have a bulk motion u infinity in this case this is completely stationary air. So, when you want to draw the velocity profile at some location. So, therefore, the velocity has to be 0 at the wall and also 0 at the edge of the boundary layer. right? So, you have two points where the velocity becomes 0 in this case. So, therefore, the velocity can attain a maximum somewhere within the boundary layer. Okay? So, obviously, this is quite different from the external force convection. So, where the velocity can gradually increases from the plate and attains a maxima at the boundary layer. So, here you have 0 velocities both at the solid wall and at the boundary edge of the boundary layer and therefore, it has to reach a maxima somewhere within the boundary layer. We do not know which what is this location we will find it out in the due course and also we do not know what is the value of this maximum velocity. Right? So, let us say this is your u max. In the case of external forced convection you know that u max is equal to u infinity, but in this case we do not know that we have to get it from the solution. right? And how will the temperature profile look in this case? So, you have the maximum temperature here and minimum temperature. So, this will be similar to your external convection forced convection for a flat plate. right? So, the same way if you draw the velocity profile for this case, so it will be 0 at the two edges and then it will peak somewhere, we do not know where it peaks and similarly if you draw the temperature profile, so this is your plate. So, you have higher temperature outside and then lower temperature close to the plate. Okay. So, this is how the velocity varies as a function of y and temperature as a function of y. Correct. So, we have demonstrated I mean the fundamentals of the motion of convective boundary layer when you have buoyancy 
in the case where we have a heated plate and a cooled plate. Now, let us try to derive the governing equations for this case. Okay. We will keep the boundary layer as the example. So, you have a vertical flat plate boundary layer, natural convection and let us try to derive the governing equation. So, let us assume that the, the length of this plate to be capital L. Okay. This is one of the characteristic dimensions that we will use in non-dimensionalizing the, the boundary layer equations. But before we go to the boundary layer equation, let us first write down what will be the Navier-Stokes equations, two-dimensional steady state Navier-Stokes equations for the natural convective boundary layer past a vertical flat plate. So, how will the continuity equation look? What will be the convective uh, continuity equation in this case? d by d x of rho u. So, unlike the external force convection, we cannot claim that density is a constant. This is an incompressible fluid, but density is now a function of temperature and therefore, since temperature is a function of position, so density becomes a function of space and therefore, we cannot take rho outside the derivative. Okay. So, locally it will lo look like it is a compressible fluid because the density keeps varying with different position. So, you cannot therefore, directly at a first cut say that this is a incompressible approximation straight away. We cannot directly pull density outside the derivative and say it is a constant, right. However, it was um, shown later by Businesk, okay. So, Businesk made the approximation that it is fairly reasonable to treat density as a constant in the continuity equation and also for the most part of the momentum equation except in the body force term of the momentum equation. So, the body force this, this, this is where the driving potential the density difference emerges as a function of temperature difference. So, except for the body force term which is the driving potential it is reasonably good enough to approximate the density to be a constant everywhere else in the other equations or other parts of the equations provided the temperature differences are small enough. If the temperature differences are very large even the business approximation will not be held valid. So, what we will do is just to um, start off we will make a approximation as done by business and therefore, try to pull density outside as a constant from the continuity equation okay, and also the convective part of the momentum equation. So, therefore, if you write down the x momentum and y momentum and invoking the business approximation. So, let us da, ri, first write down the x momentum equation. How does the x momentum equation look? So, you have let us keep density outside the derivative, but let us not divide it by density right away. So, rho of u du by dx plus v du by dy this is your convective term. So, according to the business approximation he says both in the continuity equation and in the convective part of the convective acceleration part of the momentum equation you can take density to be a constant. So, this is equal to what are all the terms on the right hand side minus of d p by d x. So, now, now this is the momentum in the direction of the plate that is in the vertical direction. So, you have d p by d x plus mu into d square u by d x square 
p square u by dy square and then what else you have the body force. So, here definitely the gravitational acceleration cannot be neglected. So, the body force is nothing but the gravitational acceleration g which is acting downwards. So, therefore, we put a minus g right. So, we have rho g correct right. So, now once again similar to the external uh, force convective boundary layer if you do a scaling analysis we can or an order of magnitude analysis we can show that the, the diffusion in the vertical direction and the, the diffusion in the y direction here the y direction is the horizontal direction now okay Cartesian x Cartesian y and is this is much greater than your diffusion along the length of the plate okay. So, this is the same conclusion that we also got from external force convection and therefore, for the sake of simplicity we will only write the diffusion perpendicular to the plate or in the direction across the boundary layer okay. So, this is the most dominant direction of the viscous diffusion right. So, therefore, we have the x momentum can you write down the y momentum similarly. So, can we write down the <coughs> so what do we have for the convective terms in the y momentum u dv by dx plus v dv by dy, but we do not have any v velocity in this case we have only u velocity which is varying as a function of y we do not have any v velocity that is velocity perpendicular to the plate length okay. So, therefore, the advective term or the convective term of the y momentum equation will be 0 on the right hand side you will have pressure gradient term dp by dy there is no diffusion of the v momentum also and there is no body force in the y direction okay. So, essentially dp by dy is equal to approximately 0 very small the, the others are very small. So, we can approximate it to 0. So, that means p is not a function of y that means p is a constant along y. So, this is the same conclusion that we also got for the external forced convection okay. That means, the pressure that you calculate outside the boundary layer the same variation also happens inside the boundary layer. So, if you draw therefore, a line here the pressure at this point outside the boundary layer will be the same as the pressure within the boundary layer. Okay. So, that is why your dp by dy is approximately 0. So, this also says that the pressure variation that you find outside the boundary layer that is dp by dx here will be the same as what you have as dp by dx inside the boundary layer. So, therefore, now since we have this continuity and the x momentum equation we do not have an additional equation for pressure. So, how do we therefore, approximate dp by dx in this case. So, now therefore, we have to calculate dp by dx by writing down the momentum equation outside the boundary layer. Since we say that dp by dx can be obtained from applying it outside the boundary layer. So, outside the boundary layer these become the Euler equations okay. In this case there is no advection at all. So, essentially the convective term is completely 0. So, if you write the momentum equation outside the boundary layer, so you end up with minus dp by dx and then what else? So, you do not have advection term, you have you do not have any diffusion term outside there is no viscosity 
and you have but body force okay but we will distinguish the density within the boundary layer from outside so we will express the density here as rho infinity okay so outside the boundary layer we will use rho infinity here therefore we will write this as minus rho infinity g is equal to 0 so this gives that my dp by minus dp by dx is equal to rho infinity times g so therefore i can find my pressure gradient along the plate by applying the equation outside the boundary layer and i determine that this is nothing but the gravitational acceleration outside Sir, yeah so what is the logic of taking this why we are not taking such a response? yeah so in the case that inside we don't know how the variation is otherwise we have to solve for this and we we have to build another equation to solve for it or we have to use the equation of state correct so in order to therefore simplify it we take it outside the boundary layer and we see that already from momentum equation we get the clue that there is no variation of pressure along y so therefore dp by dx doesn't matter whether you calculate inside or outside and outside it simply is equal to the gravitational acceleration so if you directly substitute it now you are eliminating dp by dx from the momentum equation therefore now if you substitute for dp by dx you have mu d square u by dy square here so minus dp by dx is rho infinity so therefore you have rho infinity minus rho times g so this will be the <coughs> body force okay so the effect of rho infinity g is coming from dp by dx and the default body force is rho g so this difference rho infinity minus rho what is this force this is your buoyancy force so this is the net buoyancy force which is now driving the momentum in the natural convection right so if the buoyancy force is zero then you don't have any boundary layer growth okay the boundary layer growth happens in this case only because of this density difference and what is causing this density difference temperature difference so now this is where business approximation is used in the sense we are ignoring the variation of density as a function of temperature elsewhere except in the body force term okay so now to invoke the businessk approximation so we will define the coefficient of thermal expansion beta okay so beta is the coefficient of thermal expansion so this is written as minus 1 by rho d rho by dt so what it simply measures is the variation of density of a particular fluid with respect to temperature okay so if this coefficient is high that means you have a potential that this um, fluid can expand or contract very quickly very strongly as a function of temperature okay so the higher the value of beta indicates that the potential for this density difference can be higher okay and these are usually measured as a part of the thermophysical properties just like thermal conductivity specific heat capacity and so on and they are tabulated for different gases okay and for ideal gas what will be the value of beta how do you calculate beta if you make the ideal gas equation of state if you put in the ideal gas equation of state into this so it will come out simply as 1 by t okay so why we are putting a negative sign here because usually the density decreases as you are temperature increases okay so in order to make sure that this coefficient is positive okay 
thermal expansion coefficient is positive, we put a negative sign here, all right. So, therefore, now if you apply the calculate, use a simple finite difference, okay, assuming a linear variation of density with temperature, okay. If you want to calculate the variation from some um, reference temperature T infinity to actual temperature T, okay. So, how, how will this look? You have minus 1 by rho, rho minus rho infinity divided by T minus T infinity, okay. If you assume that for small changes in temperature, we can assume a linear variation in density, okay, and therefore, we can just approximate the derivative d rho by dt as rho minus rho infinity by t minus t infinity. Now, you can therefore, substitute for this buoyancy force rho infinity minus rho from this particular coefficient. So, therefore, what do you get? Rho minus rho infinity is equal to minus g beta into t minus t infinity or rho infinity minus rho is equal to g beta t minus t infinity. So, this is basically the relation between the buoyancy force to the driving potential which is the temperature difference. So, you can therefore, substitute for rho infinity minus rho from there. So, I, I just uh, take g should not be here, I am sorry. So, once you substitute into this, you have g. So, you have therefore, g beta into t minus t infinity. Also, there is a rho here, right. Yeah, you have a rho here, okay rho beta into t minus t infinity, right. Okay. So, therefore, now your buoyancy force is now written as a function of temperature difference. So, this, this is now what we call as the momentum equation invoking the business approximation. The business approximation says that the density can be treated as a constant in the advection part, whereas you invoke that as a function of temperature in the body force term. So, now if you divide it throughout by rho, so now this looks similar to your external post convection boundary layer equation except the last term which is g beta into t minus t infinity, right. So, this is your buoyancy term or body force term. So, if your temperature difference is 0, there is no natural convection boundary layer and therefore, the boundary layer grows because of this temperature difference. So, now you can write down the energy equation also. How, the, how does the energy equation look? So, it will be no different from your external force convective boundary layer equation, right. Q dt by dx plus v dt by dy is equal to alpha into t square t by dy square. We can neglect again heat diffusion in the x direction with respect to y and if you also neglect the viscous dissipation, okay. We are talking about small values of Eckert numbers. So, in that case, this will be your same as your external laminar forced convection past a flat plate, okay. So, this will not change. Now, what is the major difference is the inclusion of the buoyancy term into the momentum equation. So, now you can see that unlike the, the other case where you solve the momentum equation first, get the velocity profile. So, this is how Blasius did. First, Blasius solved the hydrodynamic part, he got the velocity profile, then Polhausen used that, then he solved the energy equation. But here, the velocity profile itself is coming from the temperature, okay. So, you cannot therefore, do it in a serial sequential fashion. So,
So, all of these has to be simultaneously coupled and solved. Now, this is where the complication comes. Okay? So, that means you cannot find a simple sequential segregated solution unlike the case of external force convection. So, you have to couple all these equations and solve them. Okay? Now, we will see uh, in the due course of another one or two lectures, we will see how to solve these equations one after the other for different boundary conditions. But before doing that, so now that we derived the governing equations, let us try to non-dimensionalize them taking some reference parameters and see what are the non-dimensional numbers that come out. Okay? So, I request all of you to scale the all the uh, variables here that means, you take your position x and scale it with the length of the plate, this will be your non-dimensional x, similarly your non-dimensional y and how do you scale velocity here. u max because we do not have u infinity. But the complication here is we do not know what is u max a priori, right. This is happening within the boundary layer which comes out of the solution, but for the time being you do not worry about it, you just assume that u max is your reference. Okay? So, we will call this as a reference velocity u subscript r, some reference velocity. It not, need not be u max also, it can be any other velocity. Okay. So, some reference velocity which we do not similarly your V also. Okay. Now, we do not have pressure term explicitly, so you do not have to worry about non dimensionalizing the pressure and what about temperature now. So, again we introduce non dimensional temperature theta. Okay. When we do the non dimensionalization let us do it assuming a constant wall temperature, so that we can write this as T minus T infinity by T wall minus T infinity. All right. So, I will give you about 5, 5 to 10 minutes time, you please substitute this into the governing equation and find out what are the non dimensional groups. So, I will write the final expression on the board, but you please work it out and check. So, all of you please check whether 
you get the same non dimensional groups. So, is that okay? So, you have therefore, 1 over Reynolds number here okay, and you have 1 over Reynolds number times Prandtl number. Okay. So, if you define your Reynolds number now as u r into L by nu, some reference velocity times the total plate length. So, you can therefore, write this as 1 over Reynolds number and this as 1 over Reynolds number times Prandtl number. Hmm? Well, what about this? Now, you have an additional non dimensional group. If you see this as no units, what is the unit of beta? Kelvin inverse. Okay. So, this entire thing will be again a non dimensional group. Okay. Now, this represents the ratio of two forces. The numerator is nothing but the buoyancy force. Okay, your g beta into T wall minus T infinity is nothing but the density difference rho minus rho infinity and the denominator is your inertial force. Okay. So, we will now define a non dimensional number in natural convection this is called the Grashof number. So, usually denoted as g r. Okay. This is the ratio of buoyancy force g beta into T wall minus T infinity into L cube divided by the viscous force nu square. Okay. So, this is basically the ratio of buoyancy and viscous force. So, you can imagine that this Grashof number is somewhat analogous to the Reynolds number in force convection. So, there you have inertial force, here the inertial force is replaced by the buoyancy force or in fact, the inertia here is driven by buoyancy okay. and therefore, you can write this ratio of buoyancy to viscous from using the Grashof number and Reynolds number because Grashof number is a function of buoyancy and viscous force, Reynolds number function of is nothing but inertia and viscous force. So, therefore, you can write g beta L into T wall minus T infinity by u r square. How do you express this in terms of Grashof and Reynolds number? turns out to be that this is nothing but Grashof by Reynolds number square. Okay. So, therefore, this entire non dimensional group is nothing but the ratio of Grashof to Reynolds number square. Okay. So, in the process we have therefore, defined a new non dimensional number which is uh, very much relevant to natural convection which is now called as the Grashof number ratio of buoyancy to viscous force analogous to the Reynolds number. Now, from this can we kind of estimate what is the order of the reference velocity. Okay. So, what is the equivalence of Grashof and Reynolds number? So, you can say that Grashof number to the power half is of the same order as the Reynolds number correct because we have g r by r e square. That means, the order of r e square should be of the same order as g r. Now, therefore, you can substitute the expression for Grashof number Reynolds number then calculate what is the order of the expression for calculating the order of u reference. Okay. So, this is nothing but g beta t wall minus t infinity L cube divided by u square to the power half 
which is equal to u r l by mu. So, from this what do you get for u r? Hmm? So, you have L power 3 by 2 minus 1 which is L power half. Okay? So, you have nu nu which cancels. Therefore, u r should be square root of g beta into t wall minus t infinity into L. Okay? So, to get your reference velocity at least the order of it, you can therefore use this particular expression. Okay, otherwise, from your, um, you know, when you non-dimensionalize it, you don't know what is your reference velocity. But you can now, using the order of magnitude between Grashof and Re square, you can therefore come to some reasonably good estimate of reference velocity. Okay, so you can see that this reference velocity is nothing but what is going into your Reynolds number definition and here it is driven by your temperature difference. If there is no temperature difference, therefore there is no inertia. Okay? The inertia is essentially arising from the buoyancy term which is actually a function of your temperature difference. Therefore, the, you can classify different regimes. Now, what we have seen is a pure natural convection case but you can also have a case where you can combine your forced convection with buoyancy. That means you can have a regular bulk velocity. Let us say this is your u infinity and the temperature difference is also substantial so that you can have a boundary layer growth. Now, this is a combined effect of both your forced convection and natural convection. Okay? So, in such a case the same equations are valid. Right? So, but in that case your u reference there you can actually use as u infinity because even if you do not have any temperature difference the forced convective boundary layer will still exist. Okay? So, when you define the Reynolds number in that case, you can define Reynolds number using u infinity, okay, which indicates the external bulk convective motion and the Grashof number is still decided by the buoyancy, ratio of buoyancy to viscous, viscous forces. Okay. So, in that case, what is important? What are the different regimes and what are the, how are the different regimes classified is by the ratio of Grashof by Re square. Okay? So, if you are talking about these values much lesser than 1, that means your bulk velocity is now overpowering your buoyancy force. So, in that case you can ignore natural convection and therefore, this is only pure force convection. So, remember in this case we define Reynolds number as u infinity L by mu, correct. So, in this case when Grashof by Re square is very small, you ignore your natural convective effects, buoyancy effects. On the other hand if your Grashof by Re square is very large, that means your buoyancy force is dominating your bulk motion. So, here this will be your natural convection. So, by the way the other name for natural convection is called free convection. Since you do not spend you know you are not putting any effort in driving happening in making this convection happen it happens naturally and therefore, it is called free, free convection. So, so the re regions where this is significant that is the order of 1 
okay. So, here this is called mixed convection. So, in the case of mixed convection both the effects of forced convection and natural convection will be equally significant, you cannot complete, completely ignore therefore either of them. So, we have already seen cases of forced convection derived the correlations for Nusselt number and so on, similarly for natural convection we will do it. Now, what happens in mixed convection okay. So, in mixed convection the most simplest way of approaching this is the Nusselt number in mixed convection is simply calculated from independent correlations for post convection and pre convection and we just use some power law to blend these two okay. So, this is one of the simplest approaches. So, here the value of m could be either 0.3 or 0.4 okay. So, we will stop here, um, so tomorrow's class we will look at the different ways of solving the governing equations okay. So, for first starting with the constant wall temperature case then with the constant heat flux case and so on okay, thank you.